Hello. This lecture is on US foreign policy, and the title of the lecture is America and the Middle East, 1980 to 2000. With the Iranian Revolution in 1979 and the rise of Islamic fundamentalism, many Americans learned that the Middle East was the most troublesome and dangerous region in the world. The American goal of stability in the Middle East would not be easy. In the 1980s, President Ronald Reagan's administration faced serious issues as it dealt with the ongoing Arab-Israeli conflict, complicated with the emergence of Islamic groups such as Hezbollah in the early 1980s and Hamas in 1988. In the 1990s, the Persian Gulf War and the rise of Islamic terrorism caused additional problems for Presidents George Bush and Bill Clinton. During the early Reagan years, Israel's main security issue was the Palestinian Liberation Organization in Lebanon. The Israeli Defense Minister Ariel Sharon told the Americans in December 1981 that, quote, we will have no choice but to wipe them out completely in Lebanon. In the spring of 1982, Secretary of State Alexander Haig relayed to Sharon that unless there was an, an internationally recognized provocation, and unless Isra Israeli retaliation was proportionate to any such provocation, an attack by Israel into Lebanon would have a devastating effect in the United States. In early June, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon called Peace in Galilee was a military success. They scored victories against Syrian and Palestinian troops and they destroyed the Syrian Air Force. The timing of the invasion, however, proved embarrassing to the United States. Reagan was in a goodwill visit in Europe and there was the impression that he was unable to restrain Israel or even worse, had tacitly approved the invasion. The Americans worked on an agreement between Israel and the Palestinians that went as follows. Israel would end its military offensive and the Palestinians would depart Lebanon and go elsewhere. But finding Arab countries prepared to welcome the Palestinians was not easy. Arab governments did not trust the PLO and for all their pro-Palestinian rhetoric, worried more about a potential PLO threat to them than, the, than about the fate of the besieged PLO. The American government sent 800 US Marines in Le to Lebanon to add to the multinational force ordered to help supervise the Palestinian evacuation and restore order in Lebanon. Secretary of State George Shultz believed that the Americans could help stabilize Lebanon and cut short Israel's occupation of southern Lebanon. After much of the PLO and Syrian forces departed Lebanon by September, the Marines were redeployed offshore aboard the Sixth Fleet. On September 14, 1982, the Syrians assassinated Bashir Gemayel. This was the Christian president-elect of Lebanon. The assassination imperiled a potential peace treaty between Israel and Lebanon. Two days later, the assassination, two, later, two days after the assassination, a terrible event unfolded at two Palestinian refugee camps. Believing that the camps contained Palestinian guerrillas, the Israeli army surrounded but did not enter the camps. The searching and mopping up of the camps were to be done by Lebanese Christian forces and the Lebanese army. According to one American journalist, 
the Lebanese Christians wanted to avenge not only Bashir's death, but also past tribal killings of their own people by Palestinian guerrillas. When the Lebanese entered the Sabra and Shatila camps, the result was a massacre of unarmed civilians. The International Committee of the Red Cross provided the only independent official death toll and the numbers they had was 210 dead, 140 men, 38 women, and 32 children. But the PLO disputed this number. Years later, later in the year, excuse me, later in the year before a Palestinian crowd, PLO leader Yasser Arafat proclaimed, proclaimed quote, we lost 5,000 in Sabra and Shatila, and we are ready to lose 50,000 before we liberate our homeland. The massacre brought the, U, the U.S. Marines back to Lebanon. They were to assist the Lebanese government to assert its authority over the country against the various groups currently fighting there. Over a year's time, the U.S. force increased to 1,200. The peacekeeping occasionally turned violent with the Marines exchanging fire with Muslim militiamen. In addition to thousands of PLO commandos and over 50,000 Syrian troops in Lebanon, the Shiite, Shiite Hezbollah group backed by Iran and various terrorist organizations took root in Lebanon. In April 1983, a Shiite Muslim suicide bomber targeted the U.S. Embassy in Beirut that killed more than 60 people, including 17 Americans. And on October 23rd, 1983, a Shiite suicide bomber crashed a truck into the U.S. Marine, killing 241 Americans. In February 1984, Reagan pulled the Marines from Beirut. In December 1987, West Bank and Gaza Strip Palestinians began an uprising called the Intifada. What started off as a local and spontaneous incident in a Gaza neighborhood grew into widespread resistance movement as many Palestinians showed their frustration with the Israeli restrictions on their daily lives. In a two and a half year period, Israeli security forces killed over 800 Palestinians. Palestinians themselves killed another 250 Palestinians who were believed to be collaborating with the Israelis. With the Intifada came the rise of the Islamic resistance movement, better known as Hamas. Arafat met with the Palestine National Council in Algiers and proclaimed the establishment of an independent Palestinian state. This announcement in November 1988 rested on the UN General Assembly's partition plan of 1947. In quick fashion, almost 30 Arab and Muslim countries recognized Palestine. The Reagan administration initially rejected the seemingly an eminent creation of a Palestinian state. Israel was unwilling to negotiate with the PLO, and they would never accept boundaries defined before 1967. Secretary of State George Shultz, his plan that rested, rested on land for peace found no support from either Israel or the PLO. In late 1988, Arafat sought to present 
his own peace plan to the United Nations, but Schultz refused to approve a visa. Arafat instead went to Geneva, where he appeared to have renounced terrorism. Whereas the PLO distinguished between Jews and Zionists, the Islamists did not. Hamas and other Islamists viewed Zionist ideology as a product of Judaism rather than European nationalism. By taking this view, the Islamists saw the Arab-Israeli conflict as Islam versus Judaism rather than Israel versus Palestine. In 1989, Hamas began the tactic of adopting and killing Israeli soldiers. In January 1989, George H.W. Bush became president. For the early Bush years, an escalation of violence by Palestinians and response by Israeli forces stymied any serious attempt to find peace. Secretary of State James Baker was unwilling to continue talks until the Palestinian and Israeli leaders demonstrated greater cooperation. The Middle East peace process took an interesting turn due to the Persian Gulf War of 1991. During the Iran-Iraq War of the 1980s, the American government slightly favored Iraq over Iran. The Iranian leader Ayatollah Khomeini wanted to export Islamic fundamentalism. President Bush wanted to build a better relationship with Iraq by doing business with Iraqi leader Saddam Hussein. But doing business with Hussein was precarious. Although American policymakers were relieved that Iran and Iraq agreed to a ceasefire in 1988, the aggressive, aggressiveness of Hussein appeared to promise more conflict down the road. Burdened with a war debt, Baghdad perceived itself as having protected Gulf states from the Islamic revolution at great cost in blood and riches. With this sinking, Iraq revived a long-standing claim on Kuwaiti, Kuwaiti's uh, shoreline. Hussein expected the Kuwaitis and other oil-rich Arabs to forgive almost 100 billion in war debts. President Bush assumed that America could work with Saddam Hussein. A State Department assessment noted that the lesions of war with Iran may have changed Iraq from a radical state challenging the system to a more responsible status quo state working within the system and promoting stability in the region. The United States could help the war-torn Iraq rebuild. Hussein's increasingly belligerent tone throughout 1990 indicated that such policymaking assumptions were wrong. Hussein became increasingly aggressive, and he demanded that Kuwaiti leaders grant Iraq full control of the offshore islands of Warba and Bubayan and the oil fields that straddle the Iraq-Kuwaiti border. By the end of July, Hussein moved a hundred thousand strong Iraqi military force along its southern border and on August 1st the Iraqis invaded and took control of Kuwait. Immediately Bush and other high-ranking leaders gathered to discuss this serious outcome. 
CIA, CIA director William Webster stated that if Saddam stays where he is, he'll own 20% of the world's oil reserves. And a few miles away, he can seize another 20%. Secretary of Defense Richard Cheney explained, quote, when the Iraqis hit the Saudi border, they're only 40 kilometers from the Saudi oil fields. We have the potential here for a major conflict. The United States desired regional stability and it could not show inaction and indecisiveness. But was it worth going to war to liberate Kuwait? In September 1990, Bush told the American people that an, an Iraq permitted to swallow Kuwait would have the economic and military power as well as the arrogance to intimidate and coerce its neighbors, neighbors who control the lion's share of the world's remaining oil reserves. We cannot permit a resource so vital to be dominated by one so ruthless, and we won't. Operation Desert Shield was the first phase of America's military intervention. Initially, the Saudi Arabian King Fahd was against having any American soldiers and their weapon stockpiles inside his kingdom. The king changed his mind after seeing satellite photos of the vanguard of Hussein's million man army poised to strike Saudi Arabia. Within 10 weeks, the Pentagon deployed approximately a quarter of a million troops to Saudi Arabia. During this period, the United States was successful in putting together an anti-Iraq coalition consisting of Britain, France, Italy, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and almost two dozen other nations. The Americans had taken additional steps. With the demise of the Cold War, American Soviet showdowns in the United Nations was a thing of the past. In November 1990, the UN Security Council Resolution 678 stated that Iraq had to withdraw from Kuwait, Kuwait by January 15, 1991. The United States and other coalition members would use all necessary means to restore international peace and security in the area. Bush was ready for war. He believed that the world's price of oil and therefore the control of the world economy was at stake. When Hussein failed to withdraw, Operation Desert Storm began on January 17, 1991, with massive bombing. In late February, a major ground assault liberated Kuwait and pushed the Iraqis northward. Iraq suffered a massive defeat. Less than 150 American troops were killed whereas the capture, whereas the death toll of Iraqis numbered near 100,000. Bush looked for Sudan, Sudan to leave or for the Iraqis to overthrow him. This did not happen. The Americans did not destroy Hussein's regime because they feared that if he obliterated Iraq, Iran's Islamic re regime would emerge as the unchecked regional power. Bush worried that occupation of Iraq would have turned the whole Arab world against the United States. The uh, Americans feared continued instability in the Middle East. The Middle East peace process between Israel 
and Arabs gain more attention after America's victory over Iraq. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, the PLO was without a superpower patron. The collapse also meant that America no longer had to contend with a credible rival in the Middle East. The end of the Cold War and military success, success in the Gulf War caused Americans in certain circles to rethink US-Israeli relations. Some question the notion that Israel was a strategic asset for America. In the past, Israel's role in confronting the two, the twin threats of communism and pan-Arab nationalism had justified US aid. Was Israel now a liability? Would it not be better for American leaders to work closer with the Arabs? In this new climate, the Bush administration sought to improve Arab-Israeli relations. In October 1991, Bush called a Middle East peace conference. The choice of Madrid was symbolic given that both Jews and Arabs had been driven out of Spain during the Spanish Inquisition of the 15th century. Enticing the Arabs and Israelis to the Madrid conference was difficult. Israel's prime minister, Yikshak Shamir, was ideologically committed to a greater Israel. The United States persuaded Israeli participation by threatening to withhold 10 billion in much needed loan guarantees for coping with the large scale Jewish immigration from the, dis from the um, dismantling of the Soviet Union. One participant at the Madrid talks was Jordanian King Hussein, who wanted to make amends for his poor choice of associating with Saddam Hussein during the Gulf crisis. He agreed to be, he agreed to the formation of a joint Jordanian-Palestinian delegation to provide an umbrella for Palestinian participation in the peace talks. The PLO was not invited to the peace table. The Arabs and Israelis talked, but all in all, the Madrid conference achieved very little due to the retrenched, retrenched positions of most groups. The election of Prime Minister Yikshak Rabin in June 1992 resulted in a few goodwill measures by Israel, but the Bush administration did not witness much peace progress in the Middle East. Bill Clinton took office in January 1993. In his first year of office, there were more than a dozen secret sessions between Israelis and Palestinians in Oslo, Norway. The result was a path-breaking treaty between Israel and the PLO. One commentator noted that the episode for President Clinton appeared to be a gift seemingly sent from the heavens. In September 1993, on the lawn of the White House, Prime Minister Rabin and PLO Chair Yasser Arafat shook hands and signed their first peace agreement, the Israeli-Palestinian Declaration of Principles. There was widespread excitement during the day of signing the agreement between these long time antagonists and mortal enemies was widely hailed in Western diplomatic circles as a triumph of reason over destructive hatred. And the Oslo Accord was seen as a promising, promising a new era of peace. The terms of the Oslo Accord included mutual recognition, self-rule, and coexistence, the start of elections among the Palestinians, 
and a five-year interim period for the Palestinians to gain autonomy over the West Bank and Gaza. Rabin calculated that Arafat and the PLO leadership had gone from terrorists to democratic statesmen and that only the PLO could be trusted to suppress the Palestinian Intifada and its associated terrorism. Rabin's hope in Arafat to stabilize the situation was the linchpin that would govern the success or failure of the accord. Arafat complicated the agreement by telling reporters that this agreement represented the birth of Palestine with Jerusalem as capital. To no surprise, the Israelis oppose Arafat's interpretation and his additional demands. Arafat insisted on Palestinian control of border crossings with Egypt and Jordan, but the Israelis feared that Palestinian border control would result in the in infiltration of Islamic terrorists. There were Jewish and Palestinian groups who vigorously denounced the Oslo Accord from the start. Some Israelis argue that a deal with the terrorist PLO was a pact with the devil that would result in the construction of a hostile Palestinian state in a strategically important buffer zone. The West Bank would become, quote, a launching zone for military and terrorist operations deep into Israel, which when combined with the coordinated attack by Arab frontline states could result in the an annihilation of Israel. In America, Christian Zionists viewed the Oslo Accord as a Trojan horse, quote, a deception aimed at getting inside the walls of Jerusalem. Islamic radicals saw the Oslo Accord as a sellout that would legitimate and consolidate Israeli control over Jerusalem and the occupied territories. There were sporadic outbreaks of violence. Hamas and Islamic Jihad engineered dozens of Palestinian suicide bombings and terrorist actions against Israeli citizens. For example, civilians on Israeli buses were targeted by suicide bombers. Israeli soldiers responded quickly and forcefully to such attacks. One Israeli military spokesman stated that the Israeli perspective was, quote, you don't fire warning shots in a combat situation. All Gaza is a combat situation all the time, end of quote. Americans were generally supportive of Israel, but support for the Palestinians was growing. Israeli for, uh, Israeli forces departed from Gaza and Jericho in May 1994. In the summer, Arafat established the Palestinian Authority, which included a police force that received arms from the Israeli government. Rabin had to reassure Israelis worried about this development. He stated that the purpose of this ammunition for the Palestinian police is to be used in their vigilant fight against Hamas. They won't dream of using it against us since they know very well that if they use these guns against us once, at, the, at that moment, the Oslo Accords will be annulled and the um, Israeli Defense Force will return to all the places that have been given to them." End of quote. On September 19, in September 1995, Oslo II was an agreement signed by the Palestinian Authority and Israel, which led to the withdrawal of more Israeli forces from nine major Palestinian towns. President Clinton saw this as encouraging. A sad event was the assassination of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin at the hands of a, an Israeli student in November 1995. 
the assassination appeared to set back the peace process. Arafat himself was sending mixed messages in contrast to his more public words, his statements at mosque were inflammatory. He told one group of Muslims that the, the jihad will continue. Israel is not, uh, only, is, is not only of the Palestinian people, but of the entire Islamic nation. To a group of Arab diplomats, he proclaimed, we will take everything including all of Jerusalem. You understand that we plan to eliminate the state of Israel and establish a purely Palestinian state. We will make life unbearable for Jews by psychological warfare and population explosion. The Jews will not want to live among Arabs. I have no use for Jews. They are and remain Jews. Some argued that Rabin had chose not to notice that much of the weapons supplied to the Palestinian Authority was falling in the hands of terrorist organizations. In May 1996, Israeli election witnessed the victory of the Likud leader, Benjamin Netanyahu, who offended Arabs by allowing more Jewish settlers into the Arab section of Jerusalem. Netanyahu also slowed implementation of the Oslo Agreement to turn over part of the West Bank. President Clinton wanted to to save the peace process, and he pressured Netanyahu to sign the Y River Agreement in 1998 that ended Israeli military occupation of portions of the West Bank and expanded the jurisdiction of the PLO. Shortly after, Clinton visit Gaza to witness Palestinian politicians removing charter passages calling for the destruction of Israel. In 1999, Labour candidate Ehud Barak defeated Netanyahu in the Israeli elections. Barak had an ambitious peace plan that included the issues of Palestinian statehood Jerusalem and, his, and Israeli settlements and peace with the Syrians. It remained a difficult process, however, and both the Israelis and the Palestinians were having problems bridging the gap between their positions on Jerusalem settlements and borders. On the importance of Jerusalem, the US Congress routine, um, repeatedly routinely, I should say, voted to recognize Jerusalem as the official capital of Israel and move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. And U.S. presidents had repeatedly campaigned for office on such commitments. However, because such a policy change was viewed as a threat to regional stability, no president had followed through with recognition of Jerusalem as capital. When Congress passed legislation requiring such a recognition, Clinton made use of the six month waiver clause to stop any change. In May 2000, Israel withdrew its troops from Southern Lebanon Barack hoped that this unilateral move would result in more serious diplomacy. Historian Paul Charles Merkley claims that, quote, throughout the, P the Palestinian Authority, this was proclaimed a victory for Palestinian resistance to Israel, further inspiring hope that Israel could be worn down by unremitting terrorism. Arafat proclaimed that Hezbollah was henceforth to be the model for the next phase of the Palestinian struggle. In, in the summer of 2000, 
Barak and Arafat met at Camp David under the auspices of the Clinton administration. Over the 14 days of talk, Barak offered much more to Arafat than any other Israeli leader before him. The Palestinians would receive most of the West Bank, partial sovereignty of East Jerusalem, and financial assistance for the Palestinian Authority. But Arafat apparently was unwilling to negotiate over Palestinian claims of sovereignty over East Jerusalem. He also refused to renounce an unlimited right of 4 million Palestinian refugees to return to their historic homeland. Much of the actual talks remain a mystery, but whatever the accuracy of events, it was clear that the two parties reached, reached a deadlock and the talks broke down. The Camp David was a colossal failure for Clinton, who had hoped to improve his legacy with a diplomatic triumph. There were American policymakers and commentators still hopeful of peace in the Middle East, but others saw it as an impossible dream. Instability in the Middle East persisted. With its involvement in the Middle East, the United States had become a target for Islamic radicals. In 1993, the World Trade Center in New York City was bombed by Islamic terrorists. The Terrorist Act killed six people and injured more than 1,000 people. The threat of Middle East terrorism playing out on American soil appeared to be a real possibility. Thank you.